Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and I am joined by my brother, the Gritty Broman. And Brent, how are you? I'm well, thank you. All right. I've been gone a bit lately, uh, out having some adventures. Mm -hmm. Just got back from a 12-day, 12, 13-day backcountry experience with Ryan Lampers and uh, James Sylvester, who was... Uh, our photography and all around pack mule. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, but James. James was a stud uh, and total animal, He's a talented photographer. Ryan and I had a great time. We filmed as much as we could, photographed as much as we could, and and we plan to bring you that adventure on the YouTube channel here really soon. Uh, probably be a five part series. Been going over the footage the last couple of days. Uh, it's, it's, it was an incredible hunt. And just before we left, uh, we got to the trailhead, set up a, a base camp and, uh, we kind of put together uh, this podcast, sat down and, and discussed things. And among us for the first part of this trip, we had metabolic Mike, mm -hmm. also known as Mike Mutzel. And, Mike has a, a YouTube channel called High Intensity Health, and he's, a, I guess, a quote-unquote YouTuber, but he's also got his uh, podcast, and he is a health nut uh, in a really good way, and uh, he has never been hunting like this before, mm -mm. really, and uh, so it was, uh, was going to be a really cool experience for he Mike. He grew up fishing and stuff with his dad, it sounds like, yeah. and his brother hunts here and there, but... It's all very new for him, but mm. the dude is uh, fit and strong and mentally tough, and he hung with us. It's Lucky for him, because, I mean, like, <laughs> there should be a progression when you're hunting, you know? Like, road hunting as a child with your father, <laughs> and then you work your way up. He jumped straight into the fire. Right into the advanced level stuff. So it was a very uh, fun time with him, but before we hit the trail, we sat down and we did sort of a before- the hunt podcast and we got into various topics and one of the things that uh might be a little controversial might that uh came up was ryan lampers made the comment that bow hunting is not harder than rifle hunting mm -hmm. that's a little you know <laughs> i mean most people have that idea that bow hunting is easier or harder the hardest and he's mm -hmm. like uh, i guarantee you it's not it's not harder than this. It's not harder than the hunt we're about to do. Well, harder how? I think that's the question. There's some nuance in that in that statement. I mean, bow hunting yeah. might require more skill overall with the weapon, but is it harder for your body? Is it hotter? Is it colder? Generally, bow hunting is in much better weather. And you'll have to listen to Ryan's take and why he says that, mm -hmm. because you're right. There's a lot of that goes into it, but in terms of overall hard, hardness, difficulty... Difficult there, yeah. Uh, he unequivocally, despite my pushback, uh, <laughs> felt, <laughs> felt that rifle hunting was harder than bow hunting. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I think it's pretty good. Mike did keto in the backcountry. Which is freaking nuts. And uh, he actually has a, a show on his own YouTube channel, if you go to High Intensity Health and check it out, where mm -hmm. he talks about this hunt um, with Ryan and I. And... He talks about his keto, his energy levels, what he ate and all that. And he's done, he does like a compressed feeding window, sort of like intermittent fasting. And uh, it was interesting to see how he would perform in the, this environment on that type of diet in, mm -hmm. and then that kind of feeding window kind of thing. And it's all really interesting stuff. So uh, you'll be introduced to, to metabolic Mike. I think you'll, You'll find uh, him very interesting. So uh, just before we start the show, remember, use the code GRITTY at Mountain Ops. Get free shipping. Mm -hmm. You can also occasionally get another deal. Put it in. See what happens. We also have uh, Sissy Sticks, which we crushed and used like mad on this trip again. Me, James, Ryan, we all just hammered these things for 12 days and the 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 value that, that these things bring to the table is is very high. Um, the carbon fiber top, the aluminum bottom, they're just legit. So we we live 
for for poles. You know, like they are the difference between breaking legs and not. Like some of the loads we're carrying in and out um, on the slip, slick snow, like poles are, they're a key piece of equipment. So mm-hmm. check those out. Uh, they're at bigsissygear.com uh, or sissysticks.com and uh, use the code GRITTY and get them for how much, Brent? Like a hundred and... It's hundred and ten dollars, hundred and ten bucks and forty six cents. Yeah, if you use the code, uh, save you fifteen percent, I think. Yep. So fifty percent off. Check that out, and that's it for now. Hope you enjoy the show. As always, stay gritty. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host Brian Call, and I am I'm in a I'm in a <laughs> large teepee in the back country is it red cloud red cliff red cliff that's yes. what i said red cliff red cliff made by seek outside i'm here with ryan lampers i'm here with james sylvester which dude sly what a cool name <laughs> <laughs> you do get a couple points for that one <clears throat> and i'm here with what it, metabolic Mike? Mike Mutzel. Yeah. Mike Mutzel. Yes. And what was the what was your YouTube high intensity health? High intensity health, yep. That's the one. High intensity health. Yeah. Metabolic Mike. On Insta. Yeah. On Insta. Okay. So this is day one. Uh we're kinda we set up a little base camp here just up from the trailhead. And uh we're just going to have a little chit chat. We're, we're sitting here getting ready to start a little fire in the stove and, uh, cozy hey, dinner. we had a little dinner, right? Yeah, it was good. We got some good. exercise and, uh, we did get out and hunt afternoon. It was classic sort of sprint up the Canyon behind Ryan Lampers and then <laughs> glass a little and then come back in almost dark. Yeah. Just yeah. needed to stretch our legs a little bit. Yeah. See what we're in for this week. So Ryan, tell us a little bit about this hunt. Tell the people listening what 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 this hunt is. So this hunt is uh, this is a, this is one I've been looking forward to all year. So we it's general season rifle hunt. We are pushing towards the end of October here. We got a couple things going against us. One, we're a little early. Um, rut has not quite kicked off but i think they're getting a little sniffy but what we do have is we do have a little snow up on the tops here probably seven thousand feet ish maybe a little more but uh, we are getting some weather some some uh kind of snow flurries throughout the day so that's a big bonus we're kind of hoping for more more snow would be better especially without the rut really kicked off too hot and heavy yet but yeah just a general season uh, rifle hunt we have Two tags in camp. Almost had three tags in camp, but <laughs> Brian and I have have a tag each. So yeah, the plan this this uh, on this hunt is just to put a pile of miles on and um, try to uh, sift through the younger class, find some of the older class class bucks, and we've got a lot of days to do it. I think we got about a dozen days to yeah. really figure this new area out. Never have been to. Uh, hoping to see quite a few. We didn't see much tonight. It was just kind of a short sprint. Saw what seven deer, one little tiny buck, but he was getting a little um, frisky. Yeah, a little frisky with the does. So it's a good sign. Yeah, what are we? October nineteenth. So we're pretty mm-hmm. early. Yeah, but we figure having this many days, it's going to take us a few days to figure out topography and you know location and and hope to get some weather. But the end of October, usually they're rutting pretty good. Mm-hmm. So we uh, we should have that going for us once we figure this area out. So Sly's helping us with the uh, photography here. Yeah, we got a professional in camp. <clears throat> That's right, semi semi professional. <laughs> and what I want to know is, how did Lampers sucker you into this suffer fest? <laughs> oh man! Well, I'm married to his cousin, so we met man back in 2002 or something like that. Uh-huh. And he's actually the one that probably got me in the hunt and just telling me stories about the backcountry. I think I started hunting in 2018 or something like that. Mm-hmm. 
and kind of been doing it ever since. Just the backcountry type stuff. Really? So yeah. where is a little say? bit new? Oh, you, not 2018. 2018. Sorry, 2009, 2010. Yeah. Something yeah. Like that. So it's been a while. <laughs> it's a little yeah. late. Yeah. Not I was going to say we've been on some hunts over the <laughs> I was years. Say, wow, that's that's a lot in one year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably uh, 2009. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and James has done some hunts um, with me. You know, we've been, he's been on in areas in Montana with me, and we just recently got back from a trip to Wyoming, elk hunting, and he came on that one. And um, one of the things I like about James, not only is he super ridiculously talented with the camera, mm-hmm. but he can carry weight. Yeah. That's a huge bonus. He, he kind of looks kind of stout. Yeah, like a like he can good pack mule, <laughs> like a pack mule. Yeah, now he, uh, in fact, he was on my Montana hunt this year too, and I threw a seventy pound quarter on his back, and and he yarded it out for me. So that's legit. <laughs> so James, your photography. When did you get into that, and how did that happen? Oh man, I you know that's <clears throat> you know you seem to have a, quite a passion for it. I do, and uh, I started. I was doing photography probably before I even got into hunting, mm-hmm. but I just wasn't really serious about it. Yeah. But um, getting into hunting like kind of sparked a passion for wildlife photography, and and just being out in in the backcountry and wanting to show, you know, kind of show what that was all about. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I've been doing it ever since I kind of started hunting. You got a sweet. I mean, going to your Instagram page is pretty cool. It's amazing. And, and you just get to just go through you got beautiful shots. And what is the handle? Uh, it's Sly underscore Sylvester. Sly Sylvester. Yeah. Sly, S-L-Y, <laughs> S-L-Y. underscore <laughs> Sylvester. Yep. Yeah, that's it. People ought to go check that out and follow that. It, um, there's Are there photos of Ryan on there? There's a few photos of Ryan on there. <laughs> did like, <laughs> need to charge him for that. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Those aren't the oh, impressive he's, ones. The impressive he's ones family. are. <laughs> he's right. a family discount. Uh, the impressive ones are when he goes out and he finds animals out and about, like these giant bulls and bears and fox and all these critters that he's getting pictures of. And um, Yeah, your wildlife photography. It's incredible, right? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoy doing that for sure. <clears throat> That's amazing. Uh, Mike Mutzel. Yes, sir. So let's hear let's hear about you. So you, you <laughs> I'm here. I'm going okay. to school. I know not, you know, to be honest. I mean, I, I'm just into health food, nutrition, and and all that. And um, I realized that. Oh, you cranked me up. That's cool. So it sound better. So uh, you know, food is so important, right? And the best food that I think humans can get is what's you know what nature offers, right? Mm-hmm. We we're talking about you know beef from Cargill and all the genetically modified food and all that. And, you know, and there's this, there's this whole movement towards grass fed, and I think that's probably better than the grain fed stuff. But like, gosh, Ryan and Hillary gave me some elk and some bear like a year and a half ago. We did a podcast, and and I was blown away at the quality. And you know, I, I had you know purchased elk from the grocery store and stuff like that before. Natural Grocers in Colorado sells it. But yeah, I just want to learn the ropes, man. And, and my dad is, you know, he's a business guy. He wasn't a hunter, and we did a little bit of fishing and stuff like that growing up, but not nothing like this. So it's like. Yeah. Where do, you, where do you go to learn? Well, and who? What better group of people to learn from from with you guys? I mean, I'm super grateful, and and so I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm excited to learn. What, the what's, what's crazy is Ryan tells me that uh, he's like, yeah, there's there's a friend of ours. He's coming on this hunt too, and you know, he's got a, a um, you know big YouTube channel. He's super knowledgeable about health and wellness and and all that, and. And uh, and my first question was, this is like the most advanced hunt you can kind of go on. <laughs> it's like physically, yeah. Uh, yeah. like it's long, it's cold, it's late season, heavy packs, night hikes, inevitably. I was like, can is he? Is it's he ready? steady. Is like, he ready? Can, like, is this the first hunt a guy? I mean, yeah. normally you like kind of road hunt a little bit, and then you know that is the he's... natural progression. But <laughs> why not like throw him into the fire and uh, have him see? why we like this stuff so much. I'm in, um, man. I you mean, get I to see up, this type of country. Yeah, I grew up backcountry skiing and skiing. And so, like, being cold and hiking, I'm not. Yeah, you went out tonight and didn't uh, skip a beat. 
So yeah, it'll be fun. I mean, I just I hope I can contribute and, and learn and share the ex- really what I want to do is share the experience. Yeah, yeah. With people who think hunting and hunters are like bad people, because there's a lot of people like, oh, why would you why would you kill a happy deer when you can just buy a cow from the grocery store? Like, the, right. there's a big chasm. I think people <laughs> just don't get it. Right, like like that deer was grown. In, in, on a tree and somebody plucked it or I mean that cow you know <laughs> and that cow was not happy anyway so you're like mm-hmm. the deer did live a good life if you take it right and it takes skill and that's what's I think attractive to it as well we were talking like you you have to you know to do there's other people here you know and so forth in, in this camp and so forth um, but like you know where Ryan and you guys were glassing like you have to get out and climb you know mm-hmm. 10 plus miles to get out there right so you, you need to I think it's what I'm learning, and this is just, you know, day one, right? It's more of a lifestyle that lends itself to being healthy and making more healthy decisions, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. I was going to ask you, like, what's your, because you've had a lot of questions today, like just trying to get our lingo down. Mm -hmm. You know, we take for granted, you know, our culture in the hunting space and what, what we know, and we're throwing out terms and, you know, numbers and goals and uh, and stuff and you're like this might this might be a dumb question but and, it, and it's not dumb at all it's just it's just we grew up with it so right. we take it for granted yeah and, you know so far what's your impression of just what we're trying to do and what this is all about, about so far yeah yeah you know the connectedness to nature and the animals and you have to really like be here be present and, and know what's going on i think you know, my perception of hunting, and, and I think a lot of people think you just pull up your truck, you set up a tent, you just, you know, find a deer and shoot it and you go home kind of thing. But it, what I'm learning is, it's, you know, yeah, you can do that if you want, but right. you're not going to get the full experience, number one. And then number two, you're probably not going to get the biggest or best deer out there. Um, and there's, a, but there's a lot more to it. Wind, um, I mean, you know, temperature conditions, you know, Ryan's talking about snow, how that's a good thing because it drives, you know, the bulls down, all that. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, and I've only, again, day one, don't know crap, (laughs) right? But I see there's way more that goes into this that a lot of people really don't appreciate, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, I'm excited. Absolutely. No, I think we're in for a good week. And it's nice to have the days because there's no pressure, right? Right. I mean, we know... Uh, in fact, we kind of talked about this and joke about this, you know, uh, what if we do see a a pretty good buck on the first day and, um, (laughs) everybody's got their own little sayings for that. Uh, I say pass on the first day, what you can shoot on the last day (laughs) simply because you get the entire experience. It, It would be a little bit of a drag to come out here, shoot one the first day or second day or third day. Now you had all these days lined up and you're done. Now, the weather's pretty good. We could, you know, obviously still go see a ton of country and see a lot of animals. But what I'm looking for on this trip is um, doing a lot of glassing, like showing Mike what these deer do. Mm -hmm. We were talking about mannerisms of deer. How do you pay attention to them? How they're different now when they're starting to get ruddy versus when they're like full rut or pre-rut. We're going to see a lot of that on this trip. Um, We should get some pretty good video of it. And, uh, you know, Mike's set up with... um, some glass and he'll be able to kind of just see what we see and pay attention to these bucks and kind of size them up, try to, you know, determine age class, all these different things that we're going to be doing throughout these days. So I, I just like the fact that you took this amount of time off because you don't really get to see it in just a few days. Mm -hmm. It does take a week plus to really get the full experience and hike. I mean, we got steep mountains here. We got, we got areas we want to get to. We got X's that we want to get to, and it's a long ways off. So it's going to take some time, and we may get hunkered down with some weather like we have yeah. right now. Um, but as long as we have the days, you know, we'll have some real, and real good ones up there. With with a hunt this with this many days involved, you know, twelve days in this backcountry, it's it's a logistical problem to a degree because you know you need food. That's a lot of days. Every day you're back here, your food weighs typically about two pounds a, a day. Pounds, yeah. That's, this time of year, we got heavier gear. Mm-hmm. We're packing rain jackets. We're packing extra puffies and heavier gloves and all that stuff. It, it definitely gets a little heavier right now. And you get way deep back in there, and then you kill a big animal, and you butcher it. 
Now you got to carry all that crap you t- carried in with you, plus the animal out. It's a it's rough, but if you got days, you can do it. Just yeah. take your time. You move, you know, so many miles a day. Do what you can. It's pretty cool. Days are everything. <laughs> Absolutely, just makes you feel like there's you don't rush yourself. Having yeah. hunted with Ryan more, you know, there's always a lot of days when you're with Ryan. <laughs> I remember when he came on his first hunt with me. We invited him up to go on that coos deer hunt Mm -hmm. in Arizona. And the sucker shows up and kills a Boone and Crockett buck on the first day. Second day. Second second (laughs) full day. Uh, But So we get there, but he sees a giant on the first day. And then he's like, well, I'm just going to spend the next week or two here until I kill that buck. Mm. I was like, what? The whole week or two? Like, some of us have... We got to get back, you know. <laughs> yeah, but but Ryan has. I've got a very understanding wife. Yeah, he's Ryan. and and he sets a, a goal, and and then what happens is, you know, he can let the hunt unfold, let it happen how it needs to happen. Too many people rush, rush. They got three days to make it happen, or five days to make it happen, and so they end up coming home empty because of because of pushing or rushing or forcing something that wasn't good, you know, and this is a little different because they're starting to rut and then really move. And so it's hard to stay, sit up on one and just watch it forever. But. It is definitely a lot different. Um, there's times of the year, like say early archery season, when we're chasing bucks, you'll find a buck and you'll know he'll be, he'll be there the next day. He may, he may be there for the next three weeks. But right now, you know, at this time of year, they're starting to get sniffy. They're starting to wander. And, um, you know, I've heard this said by a buddy where every night the deck gets shuffled. You may find a great buck, but if you don't rush it on a hunt like this, you may never see that buck again. So expecting to see him the next day or the day after that, I mean, he may be miles away. So it's definitely a lot different here versus um, like that coos deer hunt where... Those seem to be a little bit more territorial, a little smaller uh, piece of property that they're roaming versus up here. It's mm-hmm. just wide open. It's huge. So yeah, and I think cruise. mule deer in general, they just cover a lot of ground compared yeah. to maybe a whitetail species. You know, at least with coos deer, they seem to just get a pocket, and that's theirs. Yeah. And up here this country, there's so many folds and rocks and mm-hmm. canyons and country that you, you just the odds of you seeing him again are pretty dang slim. I mean, this country's pretty dang steep. So this is all public Normally. land. It's it's an over-the-counter tag. You asked me about that earlier, Mike, meaning you can just go buy that tag at a store. Or, there's no draw process. There's a few states where that's an option. They offer different hunts where you can just go buy a tag and go. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of always available versus uh, a tag where there's only 100. And once they're sold, they're sold. Or a tag where... You've got to put in for a lottery just to make it fair to everyone, and you might get lucky and draw, win the lottery, and get to go. It's interesting. Kind of, kind of the setup there. You know, one thing I just wanted to mention, because I know a lot of people listening are probably versed hunters and, and everything like that. Sometimes it takes an outsider's perspective to learn something new. And just like, again, day one, what I've noticed is like a key for success is patience. Having patience and, the, and, and like you, you were hitting on it, not rushing and... And it is a logistical problem if you, you know, you take a Friday off, you do a weekend, you're trying to cram it in, make something happen. I could see how that over time could be frustrating because you only have three days and like you can't. So I think it probably, and I'm just speaking out loud, correct me if I'm wrong, mm-hmm. it'd be better to like book in and just take like two weeks off. If you're going to do it, why try to like fragment all these different weekends together? But yeah. it depends Maybe. on your goals because yeah. we talked to this. This is one reason I wanted to throw the headsets on because people go and hunt for different reasons. And encompassing, like, for us, a big, huge part of it is the food. And then the other part is the experience and the challenge. And I heard Stephen Ronella say this once, and I, I totally agreed with him when he said, people on the outside looking in, often they don't understand how killing an animal is fun. Because mm-hmm. we say hunting is can be fun. Like, spending time out here and doing this, and it has hardship and toil and all that but it also has an element of camaraderie and brotherhood and an element of fun and work combined Mm -hmm. and then it has the element of death and a little bit of sadness about that and they're all mixed up into one and it can be really confusing to someone who's never experienced it 
and and they'll be like, well, you enjoy killing, you enjoy the death. You, it's sad that you get your kicks off of this, you know. And what Renella said was, you know what? If you didn't get to have the food part of it, then I wouldn't do it. And and then if you didn't get to have the fun part of it, I don't think I'd do it either. Like, why not just go to the grocery store and buy your meat? And it's kind of the whole package that makes it mm-hmm. a rewarding lifestyle. It's it's not just one part. But there are people who all they want is to fill the freezer and spend some time outdoors. And then there are people like Ryan that are like, well, my freezer's a lot of full. And I've filled it. I've, I've killed a lot of different animals, feeding the family over the years. And he's like, I don't want to shoot something unless it's like the oldest, unless it's Methuselah. <laughs> and uh, so what is that's that? That's where the challenge comes in. You know, it's like, um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, uh, I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't able to eat these animals. Fortunately, I have a lot of people on the dole that take a lot of the meat from me that don't go hunting themselves. Um, you know, Hillary's got a lot of friends and like Mike, uh, like Mike. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we got some uh, amazing bear. Yeah, that was yeah. so good. I got a. I just filled uh, my wife's uh, mother's freezer as well. So uh, we, are, we. It's easy to find places and people in need or in want of wild game. No problem there. Um, but yeah, for myself. Yeah, I, I love the challenge of it, and that's why I have that saying. It's because I don't want to go out there and be done. You know, I don't enjoy going out and just shooting stuff. I don't enjoy it. It's not like this joyous thing when I kill something. But when I got an entire hunt, like 10 days worth, and I do always try to, I've been asked this a lot of times, why 10 days? Well, because in that 10 days, you get to see a lot of stuff. You get challenge, you get the adventure. You're going to have some stuff you got to work through, like weather or steeps or distance and stuff like that. And, um, in the end of that, you look back and you think, man, I accomplished something or I did that. And that was fun, mm-hmm. even though it sucked at the time. Now I think it was fun. Yeah. And, um, you may not be laughing at the time that you're doing it, but looking back, it was like, I did that. So the challenge of it, um, you know, we put these, these goals as far as age class, I'm always just trying to get an older age class. They're just smarter. They're cagier. You feel like you um, you outsmarted them on their turf. If you're really trying to understand an animal, learn its behavior, learn the in and out, ins and outs of it, and why it does what it does, you're not going to learn that from killing a one year old, no, <laughs> or two year old, right? At first, yes, you are because you don't you don't know anything yourself, mm-hmm. and that was a challenge. But then you're like, oh, I want to shoot an older one because I already. Because you're always trying to be a student of deer or elk or whatever it is you're pursuing. And the older the animal, the more you start to learn about about them. Because those older ones are so much smarter. And where they they put themselves. Like, you know, we could probably just hunker down here in the valley and wander around and kill a little, you know, Mm -hmm. two and a half year old buck. Or we throw some adventure our way and and go to the top of the mountain. We we climb, you know, 3,500 feet. And we look for an old crusty up there that's going to challenge us, you know, physically, mentally, we're going to have to deal with some stuff to get that buck. And then we got to get it back. Down. Physically, me- emotionally, spiritually. <laughs> All of it. Is that, <laughs> that was just a LeBron James reference. I don't know if you've been following the news. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> so l- let's talk about this whole thing with, uh, we were talking before we threw the headsets on. Mm-hmm. We, we both listened to the podcast that Cam did recently with Joe Rogan on on uh, Joe Rogan experience and uh I love Cam and Joe and I I really enjoyed the podcast and they, they got me thinking lots of food for thought mm-hmm. one of the things that you were well asking you know cuz Rogan has been able to experience some incredible hunts doing like on the Tahone Ranch or sure. Deseret and he's able to do that because he's a freaking amazing dude who has been able to save a lot of money. He's yeah. well loaded. He, he can do that. He's talented. He's worked hard. He's... And you get to go to experience a place like that where the elk are just screaming. And one of the things he said, because they talked about private land versus public land, right? And the experience you get from each one. And one of the things about a public land hunt generally is you're out here with a 
ton of other people. Uh, there's the the elk. Let's say it's an elk hunt like there. They're very pressured. Mm-hmm. And so trying to kill one that's heavily pressured, you know, they got that silent bugle sometimes. They're they're really cagey. It's a different kind of hunt than when you're on Tahon and they, they haven't they just are never hunted and so they're just screaming and you can trick one a little yeah. more easily right than you can in the other place and can and Joe said he's like you know I understand that super rewarding you you've done it in the hardest conditions there is it's like going to hunt mule deer where there's only like 5 mule deer total but but if you can find one in that space he's going to be old mm-hmm. but but it's not necessarily just chockful or fun it's tough. It's tough on that public land kind of thing. And so it's rewarding, but he's like, I don't know if it's better. I don't know if it's better. And I, and I, in some ways I kind of agreed because I've been on some hunts where I've heard elk doing things I've never heard before watching colossal bulls just slamming into each other. And it's just intense from morning till dark every day. Sure. It's nothing like my solo elk hunt in Idaho this year, which was cool Mm -hmm. and and but this hunt by for sure was far more rewarding than anything i would have taken in the other place so what's what's lamper's thoughts on? i think that's the difference like uh there's fun Mm -hmm. and there's what's more rewarding there's what's more of a adventure to you to each and every person that's it's different um i like the challenge quite honestly i like the challenge of it when you're on public land, it is no doubt about it. No questions asked. It's way more of a challenge generally. Um, and it's not always just necessarily because there's people around, but because of those people, you have to really do your homework. You have to do a lot more map study. You have to put a lot more time in the off season, prepare yourself physically. Cause you're going to have to go farther and you are going to have to go on a ranch. Ranches are great, and I I have no problems with people doing those at all. Uh, Joe's right. They're probably a heck of a lot more fun. <laughs> you don't have to worry about people, but I kind of like that challenge of accomplishing something that's very hard for, you know, Joe Public to do. Well, and, and Rogan made that comment. He's like, dude, it's hard enough. I'm not sure, sure I really want to add another <laughs> level of difficulty to it. Yeah. And he's just been hunting for a few short years. Sure. And... I think there's a lot of uh, truth in that too, because, you know, I'm to the point now where I'm much better hunter than I was two years ago, four Mm -hmm. years ago, 10 years ago. And I do enjoy that super challenging kind of physical grind, kind of defeat, you know, against the odds kind of hunt. Yeah. I want that, but it's not, it's not, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. I know how it feels like when you get something the first day or second day. Mm -hmm. I know how it felt with that coos deer. I, that's not a deer that I would have saw in the last day. So I shot it on the second, (laughs) but, um, I know how that feels. And it, it, I almost feel as, as happy as I am at the time. I almost feel like I got cheated out of the time spent observing, watching Mm -hmm. them, seeing, you know, learning more about the area, about that that animal i only got to hunt coos deer for two days right and right. that was the end of my learning for the <laughs> most part whereas if i would have taken that buck at the end after some struggle some turmoil some you know nine or ten days in i mean whoever's done that knows how you feel that hunt yeah versus second day deer yeah it's completely different it's like you on your on your elk hunt this year if it would have been easy for you you wouldn't have got as much out of it. Like you had, you put in a lot of time, what, 16 days out there or so, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, that's a lot of time. So when you were finally successful, the reward is like all the time you spent, all the little things you had to figure out to finally put it together, to keep it together, to keep your, uh, you know, your sight in the, where it's supposed to be. <laughs> um, Dude, to remember all those, I just never told him. <laughs> All those little never things. told him. You learned a lot and uh, you gained a ton of information and you accomplished something. You yeah. like you it took a lot of energy to finally accomplish something. And that feeling is completely different than True. hunting but and I, just getting one a little bit too easy. I have day. I have been on the side though where where I, I've said to someone, This is hard enough. 
I don't need to shoot a recurve. Mm-hmm. It, it's hard enough to do it with a compound. Sure. I don't need to do a homemade stick bow. Sure. I, I've, you know, I think you and I both yep. said similar things. Yep. And, and in a way, it's a similar, it's a similar argument to what Joe Rogan is saying. Mm-hmm. We each have a certain amount of difficulty we want to go through and experience. And then sometimes we, we just feel like, you know what? This is just, this is hard enough. I don't need to add more to it. Sure. To do it the way I want to do it. And that's and so where, it's a little personal. And that's where the difference comes. You know, uh, it, Joe has only been doing it for a few years. We'll see what he says in 10. Yeah. After he's, um, you know, put a bunch more animals down. And, uh, you know, we've all we'll kind of watched Joe's progression. He's come a long way very quickly. Like his shooting is really good. Mm-hmm. He's uh, he's definitely figured it out. And, Under pressure. Yeah. Yep. He's, it's he's been, hunting with some good people. But it's, it's, yeah. It's cool to watch because mm-hmm. he's like, I'm attracted to those activities where where it's all in that one single moment. Mm-hmm. Everything comes down to that one moment and the stakes are s- super high. And and you gotta just you gotta you gotta deliver in that moment, right? And these like comedies like that, like it, you walk out on the stage and it's like everything's coming to that one that one moment. There's all these people out there, you know, jujitsu, you know, fighting MMA. It's kind of that big huge moment. Can you can you hold it together? Sure. And he's like, I think in hunting on that shot, that's like one of the most primal. Like you have, like, got to hold it together in that one exact pinnacle moment more than even, you know, other things he's done. Yeah. And he's had, he's had some great coaching with people kind of explaining him, walking him through that, you know, before, you know, a lot of us, um, go through the early stages where you're blowing shots. You don't keep it together. Yeah. Um, target panic is a, is a deal. He's had coaching through it with, you know, Dudley and these guys that kind of walked him through it, told, told him this is what is going to happen. And this is how you get around it and you avoid it. What do you think about the, you know, I know, um, there's the bow hunting, rifle hunting thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was talking to you earlier about how you can do a hunt, on Prince of Wales Island while it's pouring rain on you for seven days. Or you can go to Lanai and shoot an axis deer like with David Brinker <laughs> <laughs> in in the Hawaiian sun. You know, they, sure. there's different hunts out there that offer different experiences. Mm-hmm. I kind of like the warm weather stuff. James? Yeah, it does sound fun. I, <laughs> I would jump on a chance to do that for sure. But Lamper seems to prefer a rifle not prefer but there's a certain s- suffering that he wants to go through well he does. Here, here's the thing <laughs> i'm gonna have those early season august warm weather nice conditions no rain jacket required type hunts but during those times i am looking forward to these this time of year mm-hmm. late october throughout november where you got cold, you got snow, you get to observe animals doing different things. I like this, and this is completely different country. You always have threat of weather back here in just uncomfortable situations. I look forward to this stuff for sure, but I do enjoy August, early September hunts when it's nice. Um, Your pack's a heck of a lot lighter. I know that. But you like rifle hunting. I do. I love you it. You love it. So here's the thing. Yeah, we were talking about this a little bit with uh, my take on elitism. <laughs> yeah, because archery, I mentioned uh, well, this. Cause, so Because the Rogan conversation kind of sparked this. Because yeah. it's, it's like uh, I was saying, I can imagine from Joe's perspective, you know, you're in Hollywood. Everyone's woke. You know, it's like there's a certain stigma attached to, especially in those circles to shooting an animal with a rifle opposed to a bow, Mm -hmm. giving that animal that sporting chance is really, you know, a lot of people who are naive, maybe grow up in a city. It just seems like a gun's cheating or it's not fair to the animal, that poor deer. Sure. You know, so that, that is that stigma. And so I, in some ways I wonder for someone like Joe, is it just because we all know he loves the meat. He talks about it and a lot of others do too. But if you're in Hollywood and you're kind of, do you want the blowback from a rifle hunt, Mm -hmm. you know, and you can talk about the food a lot and Mm -hmm. that's a huge part of it, but, but that stigma is there. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I definitely, he's in a different situation than the rest of us. Um, I know for myself, I don't care. I don't care what people <laughs> think. Uh, he, does, I will, he does a little bit. I would, I would argue with anybody that tells me bow hunting is way harder across the board. Cause it's not, you tell me when I go out in August and all those bucks are sitting on the top of the mountain at 10,000 feet in the open. So I can see them. Their bodies are glowing red. <laughs> um, it's hard to miss them. And, and the biggest of bucks are up there. You're telling me that that hunt where I'm getting as many stocks a day as I want is harder than this hunt. This hunt has just different toughness to it. It's yeah. got the terrain. It's got the weather. It's got the conditions and it's got bucks hard horned. I like that. <laughs> hard horned. Um, it, it's tougher in, in my opinion, it's tougher to find an old age class king of the hill this time of year versus August or early September with a bow. I will get more stocks on giants in August and September with a bow than I will see on this hunt. No doubt about it. Yep. Yep. Every time it's just the time of year, you know, pre rut, um, weather conditions, this type terrain, they're in the timber. They're not in the wide open Alpine basins where it's, I love that hunt. But it's not harder than this hunt. Um, I think I think bow hunting is is always seen as tougher because it's with a bow. Um, but it's not always the case, in my opinion. I think some of these rifle hunts are are harder than a lot of my bow hunts, quite honestly. And 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 I'll go to elk as well. So we hunt. I hunt elk with a bow because I love hunting them in the rut. You get to call them in, mm-hmm. you get to scrape them in, you get to pick fights with them. You get to see how that it's exciting. Now put a rifle in my hand and try to go hunt those bulls right now during general rifle in Montana. The ghosts. It's ghostly trying to find one. It's one of the tougher hunts you can ever come across. Yeah. If you're hunting them in the Rockies. Um, now there's exceptions. There's, there's places there's where draw it's going to be easy. Yeah. And there's flatlands. Yeah, for sure. But, during September with a bow in my hand, I'm going to go out there and get opportunities every day. Um, that's not going to be what happens with a rifle in my hand. And I'm way more confident in killing a 300 plus inch bull every single year with a bow. That's not going to happen with a rifle for me, what I've seen. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of people, rifle hunters that will agree with that. It's tough. How much of that just has to do with the availability of of over-the-counter kind of public land options for rifle you know i mean come on like the areas i can go hunt with a bow because the the success rates are so low sure i can't go in there with a rifle this time of year not without like 10 points or you know lots of waiting in line to draw the tag sure yeah i mean i don't know i mean it's it's you also have like because during archery season you're out there calling them in. You could be in deep timber, and that could be some of the best hunting. Well, what are you going to do when they're not talking in what October are, or November? What about Fred it's, Bear's quote about how you know, you know, it's it's a lot more fun to to hunt, you know, with a bow than with the sureness of a rifle. If that was the case, sure, <laughs> but I don't think that's the case. Because <laughs> there's, there's something certain about hunts. there's something about the sureness of a rifle. But I think if you're if you're hunting like you are, Ryan, and you're trying to kill a very mature, mm. ancient, old age class animal, then rifle hunting is tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. tough. But if you're not selective, rifle hunting's easy. Sure. Well, and and like if, in here we could have shot that buck tonight. Yeah, yep. you could shoot a buck. Yep, you could shoot a buck. It's it's shooting the old deer, but it's finding that oldest age class on the mountain. It's difficult. Same with elk. You know, when elk are in heavy timber, going in there with a rifle is difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, Going in there with a bow during the time when they're calling back, it's not that difficult. So it's just different. I like this late season cold weather rifle hunting. Oh, I love it. I love it. Get this stove ripping, weather, I love it because, you know what, most guys aren't tough enough to do it. (laughs) And so I I got these places to myself and I can kill big old animals yeah after yeah. archery season's over <laughs> right no i love it this is the one of the hunts i look forward to the most um also you know I've, I've always liked hunting montana and and those late hunts those are those are a ton of fun but the challenge changes you know it's not just um it's not killing a buck it's trying to find a specific I'm, one or i'm hearing a theme an age class 
challenge. Love the challenge. <laughs> hey, James, <laughs> you've hunted with Ryan how many times? Mm, three or four, I think it is now, probably. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, since 2009, you've, you've been hunting. Wh- what are a couple of things you think you've learned the most from Ryan? <clears throat> Man, it's it's weird. When you go out with Ryan, um, he, you know, because he's so successful and consistent, you would You'd think he's doing something crazy different than everybody else, but I think he's doing a lot of the <clears throat> the right things over and over and over until he makes until it happens. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he told me that a long time ago. I think actually, it's like it's not about doing the right thing once, or it's about doing it consistently every day. And you know, a lot of things too. He's confident, so a lot of times if I haven't seen an animal in some days or things haven't been going right, I start losing confidence. My focus gets off. And then when that moment happens, it's, Mm -hmm. it's gone. You know, you missed your chance. So I don't know. I think, um, man, he does, he does, a. I can't really pinpoint exactly what he does, but it's, it's subtle things. Yeah. And it's every day. I think for me, um, like, keeping up with them, going everywhere, like all that's fine. Yeah. It's when, first of all, he sees more animals than me, which irritates me, but he has, he has really good eyesight. Yeah, He just sees them. Yeah. So that's really helpful to have him along when his tags already filled. Right. (laughs) For sure. (laughs) And I get to reap. Yeah. Or, or or if it's the one too picky. So I'll shoot. Exactly. That's what usually happens. That, that's the thing that happens. (laughs) He's too picky. And you're like, well, you know, I like that buck. And so, (laughs) but, um, I would say that all that other stuff I feel good about. He can spot game. I, I have some work to do in, in trying to keep up with that. But it's this it's the actual stock. Ryan, I've noticed you kind of can look at the, an approach and go, well, if we do this, 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 yep, that's it. And like a chess match. And you're kind of doing all the math, the time of day, hours it takes, where you could be, where they'll be. You know, and where you can shoot from with keeping the wind right. Um, I hunted with Bart Lancaster years ago, and it was just uncanny. Like, he'd just be like, look at it, break it down, and then inevitably you'd be in the right position. And if it were me, you know, I probably would have, like, done this thing where I went over here. And I just, I didn't nail it like Bart did each time with the the best approach. Right. And um, as I've watched Ryan, it's like, I have ideas of how I would do it and it might've worked. I, you know, at times I'm sure it would have, but Ryan's uncanny with it, you know? Yeah. He's pretty much spot on. He's like, most of the time you're like, Oh, this probably isn't going to work out. But with Ryan, I'm usually like, Oh, he's probably going to take that animal down. <laughs> right. you know what I mean? yes. Like we're going to have a long night, right. super long pack out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how this unfolds. Yeah, he's fun to hunt with. That's another cool thing is you learn a lot hunting with Ryan. You pick up a lot of stuff, oh, and yeah. it becomes natural to you as well. Like as you're hunting with him, it becomes natural for you to do the same things he's doing. Super fun to hunt with. Yeah, yeah. My buddy Anthony uh, is a really good hunter too, and I've been able to hunt with him for years. But the one the one thing that that I've learned, you know, with a lot of guys is they just work. The guys that are successful, they just work really hard. Yep. You know, Lampers, I think you work hard, but um, it's just like you've done it so many times now, y- you rarely make the wrong choice. Yep, because you can work super hard and not be successful. Um, I've hunted Washington. Well, that's for... how I hunt. Like, I work super hard, fail mm-hmm. like five or that's, six that's, times, that's too, and then yeah. finally <laughs> tag out because I don't yeah. quit. Yeah. That's, and, you know, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan. That's probably how you did it for a long time. Mm -hmm. You just never quit until you were successful. And each time you did that, you got better and better year after year. That's just it. And it's just just a natural progression. Like anybody else, it's experiences build up. And then you remember what worked. You remember what didn't work. You put everything together and you try to remember. And and eventually you kind of have it pretty well figured out. But, oh, yeah, everybody's the same. Over time, eventually you, you figure it out and figure out what's what's possible and what's not and what you can get away with is huge and what you can't those type things and actually it comes together well i'm excited to watch mike i'm excited to watch you like kind of 
come along and see what this is like. I'm excited to learn. I mean, what a great opportunity. I mean, I'm super grateful, you know, to be with you guys and to be out here. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I just want to learn, soak up as much as I can. And Me too. I want to, I want to do some more, uh, discussions with you. You have an interesting fitness profile, you know, and I want to learn more about that because I didn't hardly see you eat today. I didn't. Yeah, you know what? And I wasn't. I just had a small light uh, dinner. I tend to be. Um, I just compress my feeding window. Uh huh. And it's you know everyone's heard of intermittent fasting, but kind of another subset of that is time restricted feeding, where you only eat during certain periods of time during the day. And I just find that lens like. For example, I mean, I know a lot of people are familiar with CrossFit. It's very glycolytic. Mm -hmm. It demands a lot of glucose utilization. But what we're doing here mostly is very aerobic, hiking, glassing, moving. It's like constant. So you really, I mean, you should be oxidizing fats for fuel for that. And so, you know, just compressing a feeding window, going low carb, going keto in this environment, of course, is day one. If I'm sucking eggs tomorrow, then I'm going <laughs> to really regret saying this. But it, what I found just through backcountry skiing, like I could just have like a little, you know, coconut fat bomb that my wife made or whatever and be good for the day. And the thing, what I like about that is it's, you're consistent with your energy. Yeah. You're never too high, too low. It's just like, you're ready to go. Like I said, I could be eating my own words, you know, Friday, but so far so good. And, and it's worked a lot in, in cold environments and backcountry skiing for me over yeah. the years. And if I, I, yeah. That's a demanding activity, backcountry skiing. Right. Cause you're, yeah, it's, I mean, it's very similar. You're climbing and then you ski down. It's like right. a sprint and then you put on your, you know, your, uh, I should say demanding, but not, maybe not, maybe not glycotic or glycolytic. Yeah. I mean, it's very, it's very similar to what we're doing. You're constantly moving. You have skins on your skis. And so uh -huh. you're just going up ridges. You find a nice thing you want to ski down and you'll climb 5,000 feet a day if you're skiing with good people. So yeah, it's very aerobic, you know, but, um, the thing is if you rely on, and I'm not trashing glucose, I mean, glucose and eating carbs, I mean, has its role. I mean, no question about it, but, um, that really lends itself towards explosive movements where there's not enough time to recover. You know, that's why you get the burning in your muscles. That's yeah. lactic acid buildup. That means that, you know, you don't really, you're oxidizing, you're really fermenting, you know, right. uh, uh, carbohydrates. So anyway, we're not really doing that. It's just yeah. slow and steady. And that lends itself to burning fat for fuel. So keto, low carb. Especially, you don't you don't want to have those swings where you're going hypoglycemic, like "Give me food now." Right. I, I never want to feel that when I'm away out in the woods. I just right, want to right. be consistent. So, yeah, yeah. we got to get we got to you and I need to keep talking. Sure, man. And this is over. yeah. This is going to be interesting. This is I was pretty excited to see um, what Mike brought for food. I know his wife Deanna. I mean, they they make some pretty amazing type dishes. She does a lot of like sprouted breads and different type things that I'm super interested in. And yeah, I was really curious to see what you were going to go through, what your daily regimen was going to be up yeah. in this environment. So um, we're learning as we go. I mean, it, it, I mean, we didn't, I didn't bring any packaged stuff, you know, yeah. I didn't know dehydrated food. I mean, nothing that that's not that it's wrong with that, but I just don't want to introduce a new variable. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the other thing that can kind of suck, right? I mean, if people are like normally eating some diet, then they go to REI or who knows what and buy packaged. Totally. totally on the can all day or what it, that would like ruin a trip. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just was like, look, Deanna, this is Ryan told me, he goes, do you want to eat about two pounds of food a day? And I said, this is about, and I brought way too much by the way, but whatever. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, it'll be a fun experiment, you know, mostly yeah. fat and protein. Yeah. I'm, I'm, and I've done that in the past, you know, where I've, I've really done, uh, mostly fat and protein done a very keto, heavy kind of diet and but those explosive activities in crossfit that i was regularly engaged in made over time i just had a hard time enjoying or doing those activities yeah. without some level of carbohydrate intake that was a little higher than what i was getting off keto but i like the whole just fat burning not feeling hungry you know there was it when i first started that's how I started the whole journey with mostly paleo keto. I actually read the primal blueprint with Mark Sisson and then, and then really tried to go like 20 carbs or less a day. Mm. And then after a while I was down to like five carbs a day and just playing around with it. And it got super lean and strong and, and I liked it, but I did struggle later on. Like I said, when I was really trying to do uh, sport activity, so it'll be interesting to see how it goes throughout the week. I know Alan Bolin with Bolin Lewis, he does that. Always want to talk to him about that. So 
I mean, that guy gets after it. So mm-hmm. it's crazy. You said he fasts on hunts too. Well, he just kind of does what you do, like restricted mm-hmm. feeding windows and stuff. Yeah. I mean, the thing, anyone listening, if they want to experiment, it, it's a, it can, on the internet, you think, oh, you, you, you're fat adapted in two weeks, you do a keto diet. This can take months. So people need to be patient. It's like, you know, me picking up a bow. I don't expect to be good next week. It's right. going to take years probably, right? And so you're, you're really reprogramming your whole, you know, your mitochondria, your cellular energy, power, battery, you know, battery, if you will. So it, it takes a lot. People need to be patient. Yeah. So don't expect it to be an overnight success. I have found, you know, on the road or on these hunts, I eat a little different. But when I'm at home, I stop eating at 9 p.m. And then I don't eat until 1 p.m. And I try to work out around 11 o'clock or so or 12. And so then I'm eating pretty much around 1 o'clock after I finish my workout. And I like just being... I like having a completely empty stomach. I'm sharp in the morning when I wake up, super alert. I feel really good. My mind's clear. Once I start eating, I'm tired. I'm foggy. I, I'm kind of like, I'm not that productive, but I'm a, I'm a machine when I'm starving, you know, (laughs) and I wouldn't say starving when I'm just, I don't even notice that I'm not eating. I just feel great, sharp. In some ways I'm like, food kind of almost makes me feel crummy in a way like in a it just it's like the digestion just requires energy and so if i can confine that to a certain window i also find i eat kind of about what i need to eat i eat till i'm full and then i and then a little bit later i'm a little hungry i eat and then when i stop at nine i'm i'm done i like it i don't know why well, I mean, there's new neuroscience coming out and showing one neurotransmitter called the Rexin A is increased when we're in a low energetic state. I mean, if you think about it, it wouldn't make sense for humans to get dumber as we went further and further without food. We should get more like, you know, Alert. be more acutely aware in our, like we need to get more creative. At least our ancestors that passed on their genes did that. The, the ones that didn't, they're no longer, their genes <laughs> are not with are us. What, right. So... <laughs> So that's the thing, and, and the, our society teaches us that we have to have 300 grams of carbohydrates per day. We have to snack every two, three hours, and then now we see childhood obesity through the roof. We see, you know, ADHD, all these things, and it's really important for people to realize that that it's okay to go. And actually, you will probably perform better. Like you and I both have podcasts, and and you know, I always do those fasted every time because I know I'm going to be way better. Yep. We're, and most people are like, wait, why? You don't want to have like carb up before you like do something. That's yeah, like, people no. will be like, "Let's get lunch and then let's podcast." Yeah. I'm like, that's the last thing I want to do. Like, yeah. I want to podcast now. Yeah, while I'm you know sharp and on it, and for sure. Anyway, yeah, it's a it's a fun conversation that uh, <clears throat> yeah it requires rep- constant repetition because uh, we're just it's indelibly inked into our head that our brain needs 150 grams of glucose per day to function. Kids need fiber. We need to eat every two, three hours. And a lot of that is really kind of influenced by food industry, you know, mm. to sell more products. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, Lampers, it's time to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've got a big day tomorrow. Yeah, we, we, got we ate right before this uh, podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, Lord, it doesn't count right out now. here. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Everything's we off the table. Hard too, okay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think tomorrow we're going to leave uh, the trailhead here and get pretty deep. So yeah. probably not going to bring the uh, headsets and stuff with us there. Podcast I think gear. Yeah, I think we're going to be pretty loaded down with a lot of gear and heavy weight. I'm a little food. concerned. I'm a little concerned about, you know, 25 pounds of food <laughs> on top yeah. of everything else. Yeah. Um, and and then we also have a pack raft so we can cross some rivers. Yep. Um, we we've got we're we got getting stoves. we're gonna go in there. We're ready for cold weather. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a heavier pack than I've had all year for sure. Yeah. yeah, but it's all part of the adventure. All right. Well, thanks guys. Thanks for tuning in, folks. Thanks for tuning in to the Gritty Podcast. And as always, stay gritty.